National Whistleblower Day. It's great to be with you today, wherever you might be in the world. Uh, we have three very important people with us today to talk about whistleblower rights and whistleblower laws and whistleblower issues in Europe. My name is Mark Wirth. I'm the director of Whistleblowing International and the European Center for Whistleblower Rights here in Berlin. I also work with the law firm of Cone, Cone, and Colapinto and the National Whistleblower Center in Washington. Uh, we're very excited to have with us some very important people who work on whistleblower cases, whistleblower rights, whistleblower protection in Europe. Uh, let me introduce them to you briefly. We have Tsutsana Grokalova, who works with uh, Transparency International, a very well-known NGO in Slovakia at the uh, national chapter in Slovakia. Uh, Caroline Rat is a whistleblower lawyer and ethics expert in the Netherlands. And Wendy Addison, uh, is a former whistleblower who now runs the organization Speak Out, Speak Up in London. Uh, as some people watching may be aware, the European Union passed a new standard on whistleblower protection in 2019. This, call, which is called a directive, requires all 27 EU countries to pass a comprehensive whistleblower protection law by the end of 2021, by the end of this year. We have all been working extremely hard to make sure that all the countries not only comply with the new EU standards, but also fulfill the spirit of the new regulation by actually helping citizens to make reports, to protect employees from retaliation, to give them compensation and damages if they suffer victimization, and most importantly, to investigate the crime and the corruption and the public health risks that the whistleblowers are exposing. So um, we don't hear a lot about Slovakia. It's, it's a country that, we, that uh, is very kind of uh, under the radar in many ways, but what's happening in Slovakia on whistleblower protection is very important. And a lot of people here in Europe know about it. Uh, so Tsutsan, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, your work on whistleblower protection over the years in Slovakia and uh, how things are going so far with the new whistleblower office. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or at least here, it's afternoon in Slovakia. Um, I am working in a Slovak chapter of transparency movement uh, the fourth year already. And um, my role is combined. I'm whistleblower projects coordinator slash uh, uh, fundraiser junior slash volunteers coordinator. But all these three positions are meeting at some point and Quite often, it's a whistleblowing agenda uh, that are met uh, in the middle. Um, uh, difference between Slovakia and other member states, uh, the majority of them in European Union, uh, is that we already do have a comprehensive uh, legal protection for those who speak up. Uh, even we do have amendment of the law as the first uh, legal uh, act was not uh, efficient enough. And, and the new one uh, is bringing, uh, beside another um, improvements, a new office for whistleblowers, uh, which should be uh, active working soon in several uh, weeks. Uh, as the head of this office uh, was elected by parliament just in the end of January. And now uh, she has uh, several months to build the new office from the scratch. Uh, so. We already met in person, uh, also the director of our chapter, the, just several days ago. It was a quite pleasant meeting. It's a very enthusiastic person. Um, we, we spoke about uh, the plans, what will be the first steps and the first activities, the office plans. And as we were proposing uh, repeatedly several times, for example, via open letters to members of parliament or as well via social media posts or our newsletter or quoting to medias, uh, they will focus in autumn uh, to information campaign uh, to inform citizens in Slovakia that there is already the legal frame protecting whistleblowers 
uh, and informing about the competencies of the office itself. So just a few words for the beginning. Now, do you think that the amended whistleblower law in Slovakia complies with the new EU rules? I mean, just briefly, do you think that it will have to be amended or strengthened, or do you think you're pretty much where you need to be in terms of meeting the new European code? Well, there is always something to do better and improve things. So, and as all of you might know, and for sure, you know, like uh, protecting whistleblower is ongoing process and you, in the practice, you always find that, um, on the paper, it's beautiful, but in the practice, it doesn't work so perfectly. Uh, and this was also the case of the first uh, law that was later amended. Where are we right now? The lawyer from our organization already did a comparison between the directive and Slovak national law. Uh, when we speak it, uh, let's say mathematical way, um, I would say 95% of Slovak law is identical to directive uh, scope. Sometimes it's wider uh, in the definition of those who can be um, identified as whistleblowers. In some few details, it's narrower. And for this, it would be for sure uh, change a bit till the, let's say the deadline is in the de December, but the discussion about this topic is non-existing in Slovakia. For sure, this will be done by Ministry of Justice, but uh, because of there is a new government since the last year, their priorities are focused on the different topics, and they are quite happy that they managed to vote uh, for the new director as it was uh, promised and claimed in their program statement when they started to work in Parliament. Now you talked about what's on paper versus what's in practice. This is almost a cliche to people like us who work in this field. People watching might not be aware that uh, uh, enforcement and administration of the whistleblower laws has been very difficult, even in the best of circumstances. The directive that the EU passed has two sentences saying that, okay, all countries have to implement a system to protect whistleblowers, period. It's up to the countries to decide how to do that. Can you tell everybody listening briefly, and now that Slovakia has, I think, just the second whistleblower office in Europe behind uh, the Netherlands, do you think that the office there does have the legal authority under your new whistleblower law and the regulations that may have been passed to actually legally protect someone from being retaliated, or can the office only make recommendations for a person to be protected or reinstated to their job? Uh, by the law, the competencies of the new office are defined quite widely. So they have uh, methods and means how to protect those who need uh, protection against the retaliation. Uh, but uh, it could be also better. For example, the office is missing um, investigative uh, competence. Office itself can, for example, uh, see the files of whistleblowing cases uh, can cooperate with uh, judges, with police and with other authorities. Uh, but um, maybe this investigating part uh, is the one that uh, could be improved. Uh, and maybe this will be changed uh, till the transposition needs to be done, hard to say. Um, depends on the processes in the Ministry of uh, Justice in this moment. But for now, it, it, we take it as a step which is improving situation because still the office was established, the agenda was at the labor inspectorates. And as we did a mystery shopping uh, after one year of uh, law was in the force, uh, the numbers were very poor and processes, I would say even poorer. Oh. So do you think that the whistleblower office let's say a whistleblower is fired or demoted or suspended in Slovakia, do you think that the whistleblower office, once it's set, once it is set up, will have the, the authority to order the person to be reinstated or will the person have to go to court? What do you think? I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know so much details, but um, the, there, will, there is the authority of the whistleblowing office is quite um, taken seriously. And this is discussed for a long time because we have the law that is uh, establishing the office since 2019. 
So the judges and all the authorities, they know uh, about the existence of this and they had the time to prepare themselves and to get familiar with the processes. So in my opinion, uh, they, they will have um, all the means. And as we met the new director, she's really enthusiastic and ethics as a topic he, is her, her long-term agenda. She's very passionate about. So I strongly believe she will do and her team as well, which she's building very carefully, everything to protect the whistleblower in the best possible way. Hmm. Well, you mentioned this campaign they're gonna start or public awareness. The worst thing that could happen would be is if the government publicizes the whistleblower office or promotes it or advertises the services that it can provide. And then the citizen thinks that he or she is protected and, and then they're not. And I think that what you're doing at Transparency International Slovakia is very important to be that watchdog to make sure that the government doesn't make false promises, promises that it can't keep when, when these things come up, because it will happen. You will have cases. You will have people be fired. It's just a reality. You will have people harassed or demoted or blacklisted. It will happen. And I hope that you can continue to do your work as you have done. I also want to thank you for working with our Southeast Europe Whistleblower Coalition over the past couple of years to uh, not just watchdog the system, but just make it real, to make people aware that, that this is an issue in Slovakia, that people are working on it. And I want to thank you for being with us today very much. Thank you. It was always a pleasure to yeah. meet with you soon. Excellent. So speaking of whistleblower offices, Caroline Rat in the Netherlands has been watchdogging the House of Whistleblowers or the Whistleblowers Authority that was set up in the Netherlands some years ago. But first, Caroline, let me ask you, we've talked a lot about uh, some of the resistance or reluctance in the, in the Netherlands to improve on the current whistleblower protection law to meet the new European standards. How is that going so far, do you think? I don't see um, much in improvement, uh, to be honest. Um, the Netherlands already had, had a whistleblower uh, protection law, but it doesn't work really well because it, um, the, 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 the house, the, the, the authority doesn't have uh, the, uh, the, the power to, 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 to really protect uh, whistleblowers. Uh, Dutch authority uh, itself also states that it needs much more uh, resources and more legal power to, to really protect whistleblowers because in the Netherlands you still have to go to court to get the protection that you need and it's, it's um, uh, a lengthy and, and difficult and uh, costly procedure to, to, to do so. So that doesn't really work at all. Um, and there is still a, a lot of reluctance uh, when it comes to uh, uh, to the legislation as well. They try to implement the directive in a minimal manner. Oh. I would say a less than minimal manner. And uh, the most uh, important issue uh, when it comes to the difference between the law and the books and the law and action uh, is the um, uh, the burden of proof that has to be reversed. And the, the, uh, in, in the last letter that I saw, this is still not regulated in, in, uh, in, in the right way. They just don't want to do it. So right. basically, I'm, uh, I don't I think that they're really complying with EU uh, law. And they're still trying to maintain the difference between Dutch um, uh, misbehavior and EU uh, breaches, mm -hmm. uh, and the well, whole. Uh, so you get two two systems um, that really don't work to, uh, together well. I believe that most people in practice believe. I think it's a, it's not a very wise idea. I I, I think that uh, you should have one legal framework for all sorts of mi uh, misconducts. Uh, because now it's complicated, also for employers and, and businesses. Mm. Um, but the main, the main issue remains the burden of proof for the whistleblower. Mm. And, and, and by that you mean that, it, that, it, that the employer has to prove that any That's action taken, yeah. taken against the employee was not related to the whistleblowing. 
Exactly. Right? Exactly. Right? But even that can be difficult because you know there is no perfect worker. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody's late to work sometimes. It's very easy for an employer to fabricate or embellish um, exactly. something that the good person didn't do quite right, which you know nobody's perfect. Exactly. And another thing is that I, I believe that the judiciary is also not very keen on, on whistleblowers as, as well as we, well, uh, I think it's uh, the same in, in, in most countries, but they are not really very forthcoming when it comes to uh, giving the benefit of the doubt to the whistleblower instead of to, to the employer. Um, so, I think that there's a lot, uh, a lot, lot to be done in the Netherlands, and as you may know, we we, uh, we still don't have a, a, a government. Uh, we had elections in March, and they're still uh, fighting. And there is uh, there has been a very serious integrity issue in 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 the tax office um, in the Dutch tax administration that's been going on for many years and. Uh, also, some whistleblowers have, have been involved and have been retaliated as well. Uh -huh. And um, instead of uh, seeing that this as, uh, as a crisis that shouldn't be wasted, people are, are still trying to, to say, oh, uh, it's the Netherlands, we've, we're on top of all, all these nice... Uh, <laughs> nice lists of, of, of Transparency International, which uh, uh, I'm also a, a member of, uh, by, by the way. And I think it's uh, it, it's not good. It's not good. Even if, if it's correct that we are on, on this uh, top 10, we should keep it that way and, and not uh, and not, not uh, lean back and say, oh, we don't have to do anything because that's not true. Well, you and I have talked a lot about this and I wrote an article about your work for Whistleblower Network News a few weeks ago. People can look that up and read about what you do. You're one of the few practicing lawyers in the Netherlands who represents whistleblowers in court with mixed results. You say that the judges are looking at a case and clearly it's retaliation, but they rule against the employee employee or rather in favor of the employer, the burden of proof, the standards. It's the same thing we have uh, here in Germany where I live. But this whole Dutch kind of labor model, as I understand it, kind of encourages things to be settled internally. There's not really a, uh, uh, a feeling that things should be handled outside, that there's a, 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 exactly. a exactly. sort of a uh, uh, unspoken uh, tradition or, or practice where you just don't you just don't do that you just don't blow the whistle because you want things to be handled within the workplace with the union or the management and sort of leaping out jumping out of that hierarchy or that circle of uh, 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 privacy is not something that is typically done in the Netherlands. Now I'm not sure if that's really uh, a Dutch uh, thing it, it I think it's um, a common practice in most smaller societies because you you need each other and you will see each other again. So you don't want to make enemies. Um, and of course, um, solving problems internally uh, can be really good. I'm not against it, but my uh, in my experience, when there's a real huge integrity issue, you cannot solve it uh, internally anymore because um, most of all, the top of the organization is part of the problem. Um, and then you can blow the whistle uh, internally as much as you like, nothing is going to, to happen. Um, because uh, we, we, must, um, we mustn't forget that most in, uh, important is the, uh, the wrongdoing, the, the integrity issue at hand, not the whistleblower. I mean, he's just a reporter, not, not more than that. But quite often, all the emphasis goes to the to the person who, who uh, feels the, the the need to 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 report it. Well, people are reluctant to talk uh, inside and outside the organization, and, and I mean it's <laughs> it's difficult in, in in both cases because you 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 want to be part of this group. You don't want to be different than any than anybody else, and quite often people. Uh, uh, feel very 
very long when it when they uh, when they see something uh, go going wrong in in their organization and quite often they don't even want to believe themselves that this re is really happening um so you uh, you don't decide to become a whistleblower it just happens to you and that's often forgotten right well certainly these laws are designed to fix everything you just said mm -hmm. to, to to create a safe space to give people confidentiality or anonymity uh, where they can go to uh, uh, sort of on the QT to to let uh, people know what's going on outside the organization so they don't be, become singled out, that they don't become a, uh, a, a person who's ostracized. Um, and I think it's a little bit disappointing that the House of Whistleblowers in the Netherlands has not done a better job. But of course, as you and I have talked about quite well, often, I'm, I'm, the, I'm sorry, the law... If, if the house is really to blame, because yeah, no, I think uh, I think I think it's the law. It's the law the needs law, to be stronger. It, yeah, the law needs to be stronger. And, and we we did an article recently called "Lost yeah. in Transposition," which talks about how the eight draft laws that have been developed so far, including the Dutch law, none of these laws so far that have come forth in, include anything about protection from retaliation. And I think we're heading for a major problem that these draft laws that we looked at uh, very beautifully describe what whistleblowing is, what is retaliation, what is an employee, what is an employer, who you can make a report to, beautifully that's describe that's all of these yeah. things, but the most important piece, the protection piece, and good goodness gracious, it's called the whistleblower protection law, that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. In all eight laws that we have reviewed, uh, Netherlands, Czech Republic, Sweden, Germany, uh, Denmark, and a couple other ones do not say anything about protection. A couple laws, draft laws, say, well, you have to go to court. Well, that, that's not a, a mechanism that really works, as Caroline uh, has found out in her law practice for many years. So uh, Caroline talked a lot about what happens to a person who blows the whistle. Wendy Addison is a very well-known former whistleblower who exposed corruption at a large fitness company in, the, in South Africa called LeisureNet. Wendy is now the head of Speak Out, Speak Up in the UK. She does a lot of whistleblower support, advising in the private sector, advising for uh, international organizations. She's a, 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 a one-stop wrecking crew on this issue. So Wendy, we're working together right now, in fact, for the National Whistleblower Center to ensure that the laws passed in the EU do comply with the directive. Um, what sort of traction are you getting? What sort of messages do you think work to convince lawmakers, policymakers, parliament members, justice ministries when they're developing their laws? Do you have a sense of what kind of messages reach them? Is it an anti-corruption message? Is it a citizen participation message? Is it a message about uh, employment rights? What do you think we can say to these lawmakers to get them to do the right thing and pass a strong whistleblower law? Yeah, well, well, thanks for that introduction, Mark. And, and also thank you, all of you, for um, inviting me as a whistleblower to contribute to this narrative. I think so many, so many of the issues and challenges um, that we all engage with are um, due to um, the sort of legal mindset. So the, the sort of legal brains getting together and discussing the law and creating some sort of informational cascade around whistleblowing and whistleblowers. And I think, uh, you know, right there and there, there's a problem in that the, the human being, the whistleblower and the public interest in who the whistleblower speaks out is forgotten about. Um, and so for me as a whistleblower, uh, it's always such an honor for me to bring the human back into this discussion. Um, and I think, you know, to answer your question, Mark, um, I think human rights, the, the frame or the lens of human rights is a really powerful one, um, which I, I understand um, the whistleblowing legislation was initially kind of um, 
underscored by or seen through uh, the lens of human rights, but it was anti-corruption. Uh, um, the, 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 the agencies around anti-corruption, fraud, bribery, the Bribery Act in the UK, that's what brought the, the legal framework uh, home for whistleblowing. So it now sits in, this, in, in the framework of anti-corruption and bribery. And, and I think as a result, we as whistleblowers often get forgotten. Um, and, and I think with the emerging um, sustainable finance disclosures framework that's happening in the EU and around the world right now, um, and everything ESG related, you know, talking about the planet, talking about the environment, talking about social issues um, and government governance. I think there's a brilliant opportunity for whistleblowing and whistleblowers to be uh, considered through the lenses of the United Nations SDGs and to be considered in terms of what's really happening with, you know, what are the outcomes for whistleblowers? and the hardships that we suffer because of the retaliation and because the law simply is a misnomer when it brands itself as a protection mechanism and there is no such protection whatsoever. Mm -hmm. This whole, the, the, these, these concepts you talked about, development goals and ESG, these are frameworks, paradigms that the younger generation might latch on to certainly climate being the main one. Do you think that uh, whistleblowing should resonate more with young people? I know that we have hackers and people like to leak things. Uh, th th these things resonate with younger people, but how can we get younger people involved with, with this issue more so they can see it in the context of the new paradigms that are developing in our world in terms of greater social responsibility, greater corporate accountability. A lot of these ideas that came about in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s are now filtering up and becoming official uh, targets. In, at the UN, you mentioned uh, the, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States. Mm -hmm. But what about young people? How can we get them more thinking about what it is that we're trying to do? Well, it's good that you asked that because I've had the privilege of working with the likes of Extinction Rebellion. So, you know, this, th this group provides this generational opportunity to uh, bring whistleblowing and whistleblowers into a more normalized civil disobedience lens. So um, whilst I've been talking to some of the European Extinction Rebellion uh, uh, guys and girls, um, it strikes me how little they know about whistleblowing um, um, or whistleblowers. And we've spent a lot of time teasing out what it is, not in the legal framework, but in terms of how we can um, coalesce around very common issues that are out there. And how, how can we collaborate uh, sort of in a two pronged way uh, where they use this energy of civil disobedience and activism to bring the attention of the pub public to these issues th that are at stake. And, and also at the same time, um, point and signal to whistleblowers being these ambassadors of, of, of supporting the public interest. And I think often what's missed here is the public interest just simply don't know that whistleblowers speak out in their interest. And I think it's the energy of these civil disobedience activism groups that are very visibly bringing it into the public interest domain. And I think that's going to help whistleblowing and whistleblowers leverage from that in some ways. Mm -hmm. Well, the work that we're doing on climate whistleblowing, you mentioned Extinction Rebellion. I think this is a tremendous opportunity, like you say, to introduce the concept of whistleblowing, the issue, maybe some of the legislative stuff to people under 35, to get them to see the broader public interest concept that it's not just rage. We're not motivated by rage mm -hmm. and by acting out in a, in a rash way. We're talking about using people, utilizing people to fix serious problems. And I think once that sinks in, 
once we get some more successes with climate whistleblowing, uh, and we're at, we're campaigning right now, Wendy and I, people and Dakota, uh, to include, to have climate whistleblowing included in the new whistleblower protection laws being developed right now by the EU countries. So thank you, Wendy, very much for that. We're we're going to wrap up here, and I just want each of you to give a message about. Uh, what you're planning on doing in the next coming weeks or months. I know that it's a summer break here in Europe, but just very briefly in a couple of sentences, tell the folks what you're hoping to achieve in the next weeks or months and, and how you think you're gonna get there, uh, Susana. So uh, we hope in um, good quality cooperation with uh, this new office, uh, including other NGO, activist uh, organizations um, but besides cooperation we all will also have to monitor and control uh, their promises how they are filled out we hope if there wouldn't be the third uh, pandemic wave that uh, we will go and touch and speak to people in person via uh, live offline events uh, which is more personal more touching and more speaking to the people and they, they understand better than online. As we see, everybody's already tired of online. So the best thing will be to probably uh, the organize the discussions with the, the new head of the office and as well uh, to invite already uh, whistleblowers we do have in Slovakia and NGO uh, lawyers and other uh, staff who works with them uh, and open the discussion like uh, uh, how to do things better. Well, I think it's tremendous. And we talk a lot about Slovakia. Everybody, we go all over Europe. Everyone asks us what's working and where and why. And we talk about Slovakia, that there's this big effort. There's a whistleblower officer, the professional law professor at the head of it with a staff, with some transparency. TI is watchdogging it. It's a great model that has to happen in every country. Uh, so I think what you're doing there, watchdogging the watchdogs is very, very important. Uh, so thank you for being with us today, today Susana. And uh, let's go to Caroline. What are you, aside from a, maybe a summer break, which you probably richly deserve, what, what are you hoping to work on in the next months uh, uh, as we uh, uh, move toward the, uh, the end of the year? Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to reach out to Susanna because I'm very interested in, in, in the Slovakian uh, legislation and, and the office that you have there. Sounds very interesting and, and exemplary uh, for, for, uh, for the Netherlands as well. Uh, well, I'm going to uh, talk to, to the, the House of Whistleblowers and to Transparency International uh, and many other people uh, in order to, 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 to lobby for, for a better law. And I'm not sure if you saw the... <laughs> Sorry, so your, your daughter. Um, uh, if you could see in the chat, but recently um, uh, some experts uh, in the Netherlands uh, sent an ur urgent letter uh, to, to parliament and, and government it's in Dutch, but it can easily be translated by Google Translate or whatever you use. Uh, that's also a pleading, pleading for um, better whistleblower protection law and better integrity systems. So um, you might want to share it on your uh, on your platform because I believe it's uh, it's very important that um, that the word uh, gets out. Uh, and that it, uh, even uh, questions uh, will be asked from other countries than uh, than than, uh, than than the Netherlands because they're so so focused on themselves. And when, for instance, the OECD or the EU starts asking questions, then maybe they will uh, try to 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 improve the law. Yes, please, please send that letter to us, Caroline, and we're happy to write an article about that. Um, the Netherlands, as you said, is, chat, is a... Sure. Sorry? It's in the chat right now. Uh-huh. You don't, or... Oh, great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, 
you mentioned that, that the Netherlands is a small country, which it might be a small country geographically, but we have many, many, many very large, powerful corporations there. The government agencies have a lot of influence. If we don't get whistleblower protection right in the Netherlands, then corruption, whatever form it might take there, is going to continue. And I think the Netherlands is a very good example of a country that needs to snap out of it, whatever resistance or reluctance or anxiety or squeamishness that might exist among the establishment people, that it's a new century and it's time to open things up and let the people speak out and do what they have to do. So Caroline, thank you for your work. It's always great to see you again. You're a great friend and a very important part of our community in, in Europe. So thank you very much for being with us. Thanks, Mark, for, uh, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, Thanks. Wendy, I don't need to prompt you. I think anyone just putting a microphone in front of Wendy, she can say what's on her mind. But just very briefly, I know you're very busy on many fronts, but what are you hoping to uh, get done in the next few weeks or months? I know you have a training coming up in Kosovo. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the big uh, projects that I've got going. So. Uh, uh, you know, again, hugely grateful that um, the Council of U Europe have specifically chosen a whistleblower in myself to train um, the anti-corruption agency in Kosovo around how to protect whistleblowers. Um, and again, again, you know, I think it's about um, instilling a certain mindset in people, instilling a certain attitude in people. Um, encouraging people to play a longer term game and not just optimizing for today and tomorrow. I think this, this notion of long term thinking is this generational opportunity. Um, so that's really, really exciting. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, you and I are working together on this campaign to harmonize the, 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 the sustainable financial disclosures regulation which is very specific about disclosures around issues such as climate and harmonizing those principles with the EU whistleblowing directive, which is not explicit in the protection for any whistleblowers blowing a whistle on climate, for instance. So right. It, right. It's a very, as you know, it's, very, it's a very broad uh, notion of protection for whistleblowers in the EU that are uh, reporting on environmental issues, that doesn't align with the EU principle of um, within the sustainable financial disclosures regulation, which has something like 47 um, principles regarding climate issues, very explicit cl climate issues. So the campaign uh, that you and I are doing with others is, is really to bring home and bring into focus that the, the EU directive needs to be more explicit in what they're protecting whistleblowers from and what whistleblowers actually speak out about. Well, I think also that whistleblowers can help the EU meet its climate goals as they uh, approach deadlines coming up. Uh, thank you, Wendy, very much. For people listening or watching in the United States, you know, the US is certainly the leader on whistleblowing in terms of having the oldest laws, the most laws, the most number of cases, but the future now is in Europe. And as you can hear by the people who were with you today, some unbelievably talented, dedicated, smart, and very, very driven people who are uh, tragically underpaid and, and under-recognized doing this very, very heavy lifting in a continent that just does not have the long tradition of whistleblowing in a formal sense that the United States have has. And I think we should all be very grateful that we have people like Tutsana, Caroline, and Wendy leading the European whistleblower movement uh, with a lot of support and a lot of uh, great partnership with the National Whistleblower Center. So that's our panel for today. It was a great treat to be with you. We encourage you to go to the websites of everyone you've heard from today, Speak Out, Speak Up, Transparency, Slovakia, and Rest and Rat, and our group, the European Center for Whistleblower Rights. If you want to learn about what we're doing, you can reach us that way. I want to wish you a very lovely National Whistleblower Day and hope to see you next year. Goodbye. <laughs>